Hey everyone, this is Mike and welcome to my walkthrough for the Weapons Refrain Ultimate. Now, a couple of things before we get into it. This is a very old POV that you're going to see. This is from my very first clear because I don't actually have any other POVs of this fight. So you're going to see a couple of skills that don't necessarily exist anymore. However, most of the strategies that we are using in this POV are also going to be my recommended ones. There is one change for suppression, which I will recommend you do differently but I have some pictures to explain the difference to what you're going to be seeing in the POV. Of course, because this was recorded before the marker changes happened, you will also see some markers uh, move around on the place as well. But the way that I would recommend you put up the markers is not the way we have it over here. I would recommend you mark north, east, south and west, but instead of having them on the edge of the arena, put them a little bit closer towards the middle, like over here. Uh, where Garuda is just about and then kind of like that's so that they're closer because um, that will help you out quite a bit for the Titan phase of the fight and then you can still use those markers for all the other important mechanics that will be happening throughout the course of the fight. Luckily enough you don't really need markers as much for this fight uh, as you would for something like Yukop. So with that out of the way Let's get into it. First of all, we have three primals, Garuda, Ifrit and Titan, and our goal is going to be to awaken them. Now, for Garuda, there is actually a bug in the game that they have decided to keep in place because too many groups had already cleared with the bug in place, uh, which makes this fight a whole lot easier. So I'm going to be explaining Garuda with the bug in place, but I will also give you information on how to awaken her correctly for if you do want to do Garuda legit uh, some other time after you've cleared her, for example. So first of all, we just end up with pulling Garuda to the middle of the arena. Two things are going to happen here. We have Slipstream, which is going to be a conal AoE in front of her, which you need to dodge because this does heavy damage and it will also stun the people that get hit by this. So you just want to dodge this by running through the boss. Secondly, one of your two healers will also be marked with this green AoE over here, uh, which is going to come back a couple of times. This is called a Mistral Song, if I am not mistaken. Basically, what this means is that Garuda is going to do a cleave towards this person, and the first person hit by that cleave is going to take increased damage. So you always want to have a tank take the first hit of this shared AoE, I guess I could call it. There are a few ways that you can do this, like some groups that I've done this with, put the healers to the side and then have the tank stand in front of that so that the boss can stay in the middle um, because the place where the first person got hit by this AoE uh, will also drop a big tornado. So if you do it like here, the tornado is going to be in the middle of the arena. So Slipstream goes off, after the Slipstream resolves, she will cleave towards the player that is marked. In other words, the whole party is gonna get hit here. Um, but our tank is standing in front with a cooldown and then of course the place where the tank took that hit uh, that is where this tornado is going to appear so we need to pull Garuda away from that. After this she is going to be spawning two different kinds of plumes. We have a couple of satin plumes that will tether to random players. We also have a spiny plume. Very important that the spiny plume is aggroed by your co-tank because the spiny plume will do tank busters periodically uh, so that really needs to be aggroed by a tank, so just throw your ranged attack. I believe just provoking it also works. You just need to make sure that you're the person that is getting hit by it. Uh, we're already past it, but Garuda again did a slipstream over here, so that is why I am behind the boss. The AoE will go out in just a second over here. And right after the slipstream happens, she is going to do downburst, which is a tank buster. So basically pop cooldowns as soon as you dodge the slipstream, because this does not have a cast bar. Move back. Then we have the downburst right here, which is this AoE. And then I can basically go stand with the rest of the group to AoE down all of the Saturn plumes. Every time that the Spiny Plume is going to do a tank buster on the tank that is tanking it, it will also give you a stack of Thermal Low. You want to make sure you get two stacks of Thermal Low before you kill the Spiny Plume. If you get three stacks, it's game over. If you don't get two stacks, it's most likely also game over. So just wait until your tank has two stacks and then kill the spiny plume. Garuda is gonna jump away here. Now, every time Garuda or her sisters jump, you need to move away because where you are standing is going to be a Feather Rain uh, AoE appearing. So that is why we all move away here. These were our Feather Rain AoEs. They're really quick, so you definitely want to move as soon as Garuda jumps. Uh, there is also a sound cue for this, like there will be a screech that both Garuda or her sisters do whenever they jump. So you can use either the visual cue or the sound cue 
uh, in order to move away from your position so that you do not get hit by these feather rains. Getting hit by a feather rain does not mean that you're dead immediately, but it will put a very nasty damage over time effect on you, uh, which healers will just need to spam heal you to keep you alive. If you were a DPS or a healer, uh, tanks might have an easier time surviving it, but definitely would not recommend getting hit by those. Then over here we're gonna kill the spiny plume, Garuda is gonna do Mistral Shriek, which is a raid-wide AoE, so just put some mitigation up for this. Uh, the spiny plume will also do Giga Storm, which is this AoE that you can see on the bottom, but just move out of that, which is easy enough. After the AoE goes off, there will be this little puddle that you can stand in, which is kind of like a bubble more like. And whenever you go into this bubble, when you have a thermal low stack, that stack will be cleansed. And depending on the amount of stacks you have, the cleanse is also going to deal more raid-wide damage, because every time you cleanse a thermal low stack, it'll deal raid-wide damage. If you get one stack, it barely tickles. If you have two stacks, it does heavy damage. If you have three stacks, it will wipe the raid, which is why it's important that you kill the spiny plume before it is able to apply the third thermal low stack. So here, everybody's gonna run in to cleanse the stack on our tank. Uh, we technically don't need to run in, but we're just gonna stand inside of here anyways, um, because of the next mechanic that is gonna happen, which is friction. Friction is going to target a random player, and everybody that gets hit will get a thermal low stack. Now over here, our goal is to get three players with two stacks and everybody else with one stack. So basically everybody that needs one stack stands inside of the bubble because friction is going to happen twice and everybody else is going to stand outside. So we have both our off tank or my off tank in this case and our two melees stand on the outside to receive their stacks and then everybody moves out to get the other friction to receive their stacks. Of course every friction cost also does damage so make sure that you heal up uh, every time friction happens and then once everybody is healed up your two melees are going to be cleansing their stacks because they both have two stacks. So they are going to be jumping into the puddle. So number one goes in, raid-wide damage, everybody heals up. Once you're healed up, number two goes in, raid-wide damage, everybody heals up. And then at that point, the Spiny Plume will despawn. Uh, spiny Plume basically has a set duration that it will remain on the field. So don't kill it too soon because you might not have enough time to cleanse. Uh, but also don't kill it too late because if you do that your tank will get three stacks and that will also be game over. This is editing Ilya here after the fact. I forgot to mention that this is technically the place where you would awaken Garuda if you want to do it legit. This is where three people would be cleansing their two stacks. So right now the way that we have it in the POV that you're seeing the tank still has their two stacks which will be cleansed later to awaken her later into the fight. But if you want to do it legit, that tank would also need to cleanse over here and awaken Garuda right now, which would make the rest of the phase a little bit more difficult than what you're going to be seeing in the rest of the gameplay. So back to the video. After this is done, Garuda is going to jump away. So again, jump means run away from your position. And then everybody stack up because aerial blast. This is going to be raid wide AoE. So just put up some mitigation and heal up. Right after this, Garuda is gonna spawn both of her sisters. And then after these sisters disappear, again, we get Feather Rains. Now there are two ways to handle the next mechanic. You can either keep Garuda in the middle, and then everybody needs to go to the edge of the arena, or you can do it like here, where you pull Garuda away from the middle, and then the middle becomes your safe spot. So over here, sisters jump, so Feather Rains move away. Then the two sisters will spawn on random cardinals of the map. Basically, just give your tanks a priority system of who gets what sister first. And then over here we are pulling our Garuda away, because she's gonna do a point-blank AoE, which happens over here. There will also be an AoE on the outside of the arena. If you keep Garuda in the middle, there will be a tiny spot where you can dodge this AoE, uh, like in between Garuda and the edge of the arena, so there is enough space for you to dodge that. Um, but because we pull her over here, we just dodge it towards the middle. And then both me, as well as my other tank, are going to be standing in front. Um, because we have these green markers, again, that go onto random players. Um, but because everybody is stacked in the middle, we don't really need to care about those markers. So, here is one sister. My paladin takes that. Here is another sister. I am taking that one. Put up a cooldown, because these do hurt quite a bit. And then, of course, in good fashion, they will leave behind that tornado where me and my paladin took the hit. And the sisters will jump away, meaning feather rains, so we have to move. So you wait for the tornadoes to disappear. Then we pull Garuda towards the middle. 
we again have a bunch of satin plumes spawning. Uh, there's not gonna be a spiny plume this time, so no need to worry about that. Everybody just stack up in the middle and AoE them down. Uh, over here, Garuda does another slipstream, so point it away from the group, dodge the slipstream cleave. Go and grab your tethers. In our case, we had our paladin with two stacks, I had one stack, so I'm gonna be grabbing one tether, our paladin grabs another. Also very important to note is that you can, if you want to, uh, have one of your DPSs take one of these tethers as well. So if instead of having your paladin take two, you have, let's say, take your caster take two, then they can take one of these tethers uh, as well if you want to do so. But we had it on our tanks, so I'm just gonna explain it the way that we did it. So both of the tanks grab the tethers, we move away from the group because these will be a little AOE on top of you, uh, so you don't want to have other people grab these. Uh, whenever you're grabbing a tether, you also need a thermal low stack, and this will also cleanse your thermal low stacks. So remember, one stack, minor AOE damage, two stacks, big AOE damage, uh, so that is why it is important that you're healed up and have some shielding, and whilst this is happening, your main tank is also going to get a downburst tank buster. She will be awakened after this is done because feeding her two stacks over here will actually awaken Garuda as well. This is the bug that I was talking about before. Normally you need to awaken her during the spiny plume section and not here um, but because the bug is in place which is feeding her the stacks through the meso high tether uh, that is why you can awaken her over here. So sisters jump away so again feather rains and now it just becomes a little bit of a burn. So she's gonna do another slipstream, which we just gonna dodge by moving through Garuda. Then she is doing another point blank AoE. Because she is awakened now, we actually need to move in because this transforms into a donut after this, which you can see over here. Uh, even if Garuda is dead at this point, she'll still finish this cast bar. Uh, so make sure that you still dodge this one. And then after here, there's going to be another tank buster, but because she is awakened, the tank buster turns into a group share, uh, but we killed her over here, so we didn't see that one. Now, whenever you kill a primal that is awakened, they will drop a little puddle, which you can see over here, this little light puddle, and the player that picks that up will get beyond limits. Uh, this buff will make it so that that player can execute a limit break 3 without actually using the limit break 3 gauge. Uh, we will need a melee, a caster and a healer to pick up these buffs. It doesn't matter in which order you pick them up, it just matters that those three players have one of those buffs. After you pick up the puddle, everybody moves towards the middle and we look at where Ifrit drops. He will drop on one of the cardinals and as soon as he drops you need to look 90 degrees away from him because that's gonna be one of the safe spots. So in this case Ifrit is on my left so I look towards D and now either D or A behind me is gonna be the safe spot. So I look at D, D is definitely not a safe spot because that's covered in flames so I run to the other side and now Ifrit is gonna dash across the arena so that meant that of course across from Ifrit is not safe. First thing that he does is Hellfire, which is this raid-wide AoE, so make sure that you're healed up, mitigated for this. And then right after this, he's gonna push everyone away with a Vulcan Burst, but you can mitigate this by having some shields up. So if you're shielded for this, Vulcan Burst does very little damage, uh, you actually won't get knocked back. Now during Ifrit, it's not important if everybody's close enough to the boss, you won't get knocked into the edge of the arena, which of course the edge of the arena will kill you, but this will be very important for the Ultima phase, um, because during Ultima there will be Vulcan Bursts happening whilst you actually can't get knocked back because there are AoEs happening on the outside of the arena. So important thing to know. Right after this he's gonna do three Fire Breaths. I don't actually remember the name of this. Um, but basically triple Fire Breath. Uh, this can be done in two ways. Either like this where you have a tank use their Invuln or you can tank swap twice. Um, the reason why you want to tank swap twice is because each fire breath applies fire resistance down, uh, so that's why you need to tank swap twice. Or of course, if you're something like a warrior or a gunbreaker that doesn't have 10 seconds of immunity, uh, you can use a cooldown on the first hit, and then you use your invuln for the second and the third. Uh, of course, right now, all of our invulns are eight seconds and not six seconds, like they were over there. Um, so you might not even need to cool down through the first one, but it does help. Uh, if you don't know the timing on it because you can survive one of the flare breaths uh, with just a simple cooldown of course. So right after this 
Ifrit is going to be spawning four nails. We have two of them that are far apart. We have two of them that are relatively close. What we're going to do is we're going to pull Ifrit towards the close nails. We're going to start DPSing these down, but we're not going to be killing the nails just yet because we need to make them stronger and thus harder to kill to awaken Ifrit. And the way we're going to do that is by dropping eruptions on those nails. One of the healers will also get a Searing Wind debuff and they need to stand on the other side of the arena as it will be quite a large AoE, but you'll see that later into the phase as well uh, where you get a little bit of a better perspective on that. So what we do here is as follows. I'm going to be pulling the boss towards the two small nails. We have our two melees, start working on the back. We have one of our healers in the middle, my co-tank is in the middle as well. Um, the second person in aggro is also going to be tethered with one of the DPSs and you need to stay close because the further the tether is away from each other, uh, the less DPS that they will be able to put out. So kind of try to stay close together, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. Then the healer that gets Searing Wind is all the way in the back, like directly south of where Ifrit is positioned. And then our ranged and our caster are going to be on the southeast and the southwest of the arena, baiting eruptions. Uh, to then land on those nails. So over here, our two ranged players move out. Infernal Howl will target one of the healers with that Searing Wind. Then over here, you can see that my Paladin is tethered towards one of our melee DPSs as well, so they're going to try to stay as close together as possible. And then the eruptions come out. There are four in total, so you hit the back nails with the first two, you hit the front nails with the final two, uh, you can also overlap them. I'm going to rewind real quick. So as you can see over here, the final eruption is going to hit both of the nails. So they're going to hit three times technically. Uh, the reason why we do this is just because if one of them happens to miss the nail, uh, then the person on the other side can still do it. So once all of the eruptions have happened, we're going to start killing the nails. We start with back left, back right, front left, front right. Of course, for me, it's inversed because I'm from the tank perspective, uh, basically reversed Z or Z, however you want to call it. The order in which you kill the nails will dictate in which order Ifrit is going to do his dashes later. Uh, so it will basically dictate if you're going to go clockwise or counterclockwise for the dashes section. Because we did reverse Z, we're going to be running clockwise. So first nail explodes. Whenever a nail explodes, they'll also put vulnerability up on your whole party and inflict raid-wide AoE damage. Uh, so give your healer some time and also don't kill these too quick in succession because uh, otherwise they're just going to die to the Volnups. Uh, you have a decent amount of time for this. And then as you can see, Ifrit is now glowing blue, which means that he is awakened. At this point, the Searing Wind from your healer will also be gone so they can join the party again. And then we have another Raid White AoE, Hellfire. So heal up, mitigate for this. Right after this Hellfire is done, we're again going to be doing a couple of things. So first things first, Ifrit is going to be targeting one of your healers again with Infernal Howl, which puts that Searing Wind on them. We have them go to the left, or in my case, from my perspective, to the right. Two of your ranged, your caster and your ranged DPS, are going to be baiting four eruptions again. They are going to be running together because, of course, the healer is going to be on the other side of the arena. And then the rest of the group is going to go to an intercardinal because we need to end this whole mechanic on an intercardinal. So Infernal Howl goes on to our healer, which is going to run over here and stand on an intercardinal. Our ranged are baiting the eruptions, which is four in total. And then once all the eruptions are baited, they are over here on an intercardinal with the rest of the group because there are two copies of Ifrit that are going to dash through the cardinals, which is why we need to stand on the inter cardinals. After this is done, he is going to cast another infernal howl. This is going to go on the second healer. This one is going to go to the left. And then there will be a AOE marker, which is this little red one over here that needs to be shared with the rest of the group. The reason why we move towards the inside of the arena is so that we could get healed by our healers because they can't move in yet because they have that Searing Wind debuff. But after this AOE goes out, the first healer will be able to join you. And then you're going to be standing across from each other. So the whole group is going to dodge it on one side. The healer is going to dodge it on the other. The most important thing to look at over here is Ifrit. The one that is awakened will be glowing blue. 
um, because we'll need to dodge a second mechanic that comes from him. So all of these Ifrits are going to dash through the arena. The way how you can see which one is going to dash first is because they're kind of going to brace for their dash, which I'll show in just a second. And then our blue Ifrit over here after dashing will also do some kind of an afterburner effect where he will do a cross through the arena. And the way this cross is going to go, which is basically going to be where he dashed and then also 90 degrees from that. So you basically want to be in either the Ifrit dash or in the 90 degrees across from that dash. Um, but of course, because he is going to go towards the end of the mechanic, we need to be 90 degrees across from him. Again, little editor's note, in this case, Ifrit was one of the dashes that went last, the real Ifrit that is, but it is also possible that Ifrit is the first or the second one to dash, because which of the Ifrits is the real one can be totally random, so because of that you might sometimes have to move one space, like you're gonna see in this example, but if, let's say, Ifrit was the one on the left on the screen, then we would actually have to move two spaces to dodge the afterburner effect. Uh, you will always be moving either one space or two spaces depending on where this ifrit is going to be. So in this case here he braced, now the next one on the left is going to brace. As you can see they like kind of move forward and start glowing. That's how you can see that they're gonna dash. So first dash, second dash, our real ifrit is gonna dash now. And then we are 90 degrees across from our real ifrit. Fourth dash and then the afterburner from the real ifrit again. You need to be 90 degrees across. Don't move in immediately just yet because your healer still has one searing wind AoE going out right here. Uh, so just wait on the edge of the arena if you are the healer. And then your tank is gonna get triple flare breath again. I ended up using a cooldown for the first one and then home gang for the second and the third. Timing on home gang back then was a little bit tighter um, because it was only six seconds and not the eight that it is right now. Then once this is all done, your healer is free to move in, of course, a little bit before that already as well. So both of your ranged are going to be on the back again, baiting eruptions, because there will be another set of four eruptions on the two furthest players away. So just bait these four eruptions. And then once those four are done, there will be another fire stack marker on a random player, which we will be taking over here. Um, but because we had enough DPS, you are not going to be seeing that one. Uh, of course, with the DPS that we have right now, you also should never be seeing that one again, but I thought I'd just mention it in case you do see it. After this, Titan is gonna drop in. Don't pick up the Beyond Limits debuff just yet, because Titan does proximity damage, so you want to be hugging the wall here. Don't run into the wall, because that will kill you, uh, but stand as close to the wall as possible. And then right after Titan drops, you can run in and have your designated player pick up the Beyond Limits. Heal up real quick, because Earth and Fury will be raid-wide damage. Right after the Earth and Fury, there will also be a Tank Buster. This one comes in two parts. First, he'll do a Slap, which is this. And then he'll do a Table Flip. This is a Cleave, uh, so make sure that there's nobody stacked with your main tank. And then after this, he will do two Weight of the Land. This can be on your main tank, uh, so even the main tank needs to pay attention to this as well. After this, Titan is gonna look to one direction, a cardinal, and then he is going to be jumping onto that cardinal, so you need to run away from it. So because Titan is looking at me, meaning the south cardinal, everyone is gonna run towards north, uh, which I ran in the wrong direction. And then also, of course, don't stand into this yellow bit, because that will also one-shot you. Run back to Titan, because he's gonna spawn some bombs on the outside of the arena. As you can see over here, now there are two different uh, indicators for this, which is like this. This is the right safe spot, this is with a left safe spot, and then you need to get knocked back into this safe spot, uh, which I'll show you in just a second. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but all of the pictures that I'm going to be using today are from the Klee's guide, uh, so I'll leave a link to that in the description if you want to go check it out. Also a very good written guide, uh, so again, link for that in the description. So for this, we had our safe spot on the left. It's really quick because it's really easy to see. Uh, so we run to Titan, you look behind, safe spot on the left because you only see two here, three over there. So we are going to be positioning ourselves correctly for that. And the way that you position yourself is by using the nipple, as we like to call it. So when you see the boss hitbox, there is always this little nipple here in front, which is kind of hard to see on the video, um, but you all know what this nipple is. 
and basically there is like where the nipple is going to hit the circle that is where you want to be standing so because we're going to get knocked back to southeast we want to be standing on this side of the nipple if you want to get knocked back southwest you want to stand on the other side of the nipple so titan pushes you back you're in the safe spot uh, as soon as you can move again also move out of the safe spot because there will be a sixth boulder dropping over here uh, so you want to move out of this immediately now you could see it briefly over here as i dash back into the arena but three random players that are not the main tank will be targeted with a jail so here's a landslide just dodge this very easy telegraphed aoe um, but as you can see over here for example this player is a jail uh, this player over here is also a jail and they will need to awaken titan by creating a cascading explosion towards the boss and then of course that final jail that dropped inside of your safe spot will be the one that sets off the chain reaction now because these players are random there are a few ways on how you can handle this there is an act plugin for this for advanced combat tracker called the jail plugin where you just put in the names of your players put in a priority system and then ACT will just call out first, second or third and then those players know where to run because it is an individual call out for those players. If you don't want to rely on ACT or you're playing on a PlayStation for example where you can't use ACT, uh, you can use a number priority system. So what some groups do for example is every player gets assigned a number from 1 to 7 because of course the 8th player is your main tank and they never have to worry about this. And then as you get the marker on top of your head you call out your number and then you just go like 137 and then those players know whether or not they are in front in the middle or in the back this mechanic is also the reason why i said to place the markers closer to the middle of the arena um, because then you'll be able to use the a b c d markers as well as the one marker which is in the middle of the arena so you dodge the first landslide after this one you jump into position of where you need to be with your jails and then you dodge the second landslide for everybody else uh, everybody that isn't jailed also needs to run away from these jails because they explode and will kill you if you're too close to them and then of course after they explode they leave behind sludge puddles so you need to move away from that and then titan is also going to start doing tumults in terms of the jails themselves it's going to look like this if your safe spot was on the left you place them on the left side of the arena if your safe spot was on the right you place them on the right side of the arena reason why you do this is because of course this final jail the sixth one or like the bomb that drops at the end uh, will be on that side of the arena as well so that's why you drop them like that so he stomps a bunch does some tumults so just make sure that everybody gets healed up for this and then all stand together because there will be another set of weight of the land so the first one you just move through because these sludge puddles are still on the arena once the second one appears the sludge puddles will be gone and now titan is awakened so the landslide is gonna hit twice simplest way to explain this is where the landslide was in the first one is where they are not going to be for the second one there is a way to uptime this on the back of titan um, but just like run away to dodge the first one and then run into the landslide to dodge the second one that's the best way that i would be able to explain it to you uh, of course once you get more comfortable with the mechanic you can start doing it with uptime on the back of titan if you want to do so uh, but personally just respect the mechanic uh, you didn't need the dps back then you definitely won't need the dps now so just play it safe after the landslides pull him middle because he's gonna jump to one of the random cardinals again this time around he looked towards the right so we are running towards the left and then again the arena gets smaller so make sure that you do not stand in the yellow puddle uh, thing whatever you want to call that then one of our healers is going to get jailed and we're going to pull titan slightly towards the middle so as soon as the jail spawns save your healer because granite impact when that finishes casting uh, i think it is a raid wide actually when that finishes then we have another double landslide so just play it safe dodge this one we have another set of tumults i believe it is like five or six costs of this yep six in total now once that's done there will be another tank buster so basically as the tumults are casting pop your tank cooldowns and then you'll be ready for the tank buster right after now as soon as this tank buster is done everybody moves onto the main tank to dodge the next mechanic 
Now for the next mechanic, there are a few ways to do this, but I'm gonna explain it the way that we did it in this video because I also think that this is the best way to do it as it is the most consistent. So everybody jumps on the main tank, Titan is gonna be dropping bombs in the middle of the arena, so you're gonna do everything on the outside of the arena. Then we have some weight of the lands, so for the first one, we move to the left. For the second one, we move to the right. Now, he is going to be targeting one random player with a landslide, but because everybody is stacked together, the landslide will always be baited in the same position, so your dodge always stays the same. Third weight of the land comes out over here, so we dodge it towards the back, and then we once again run further to dodge the second landslide, and that's the end of the mechanic. Uh, we end up doing a tank swap here because Titan is gonna do another tank buster right after this, so pop your cooldowns over here, and then we have the first hit of the tank buster, and then we have the table flip over here. Then we have three sets of weight of the land again, so one, two, and three. And then we have another set of tumults, and then after the tumults are done, that's when we have the enrage, but we ended up killing it over here. So we are skipping the tumults. Of course, Titan is gonna drop a puddle, so designated player pick up that puddle, and then we go into the Laha Brea intermission. For this one, we basically need to use our limit breaks back to back. So for the first one, we use our caster LB3. Uh, the other players that are not limit breaking can also start hitting these for two reasons. One, to build resources. Secondly, because these Magitek bids don't always get one shot by the limit break. Uh, so it's good that you put some damage onto them as well. For the second one, everybody gets stunned, get brought very low and here you just want to be using a limit break for your healers then lahabrea is gonna spawn and he will cast dark four when that finishes casting he wipes the group uh, so you just want to use your melee limit break three for this and then after this is done my fps is gonna drop because i all tapped over here but this is where you want to be using a tank limit break three because ultima is gonna cast ultima and uh, that will do very heavy rate-wide damage, which requires a tank limit break 3. If you're worried about using the limit break too early or too late, uh, don't worry about it. As soon as the limit break is available, you can start using it as well. Uh, so you can just spam that button and then don't have to worry about it all too much. And then here Ultima is gonna eat the primals into his little intermission, which we are going to be skipping. So, Ultima phase, the final phase of the fight, or the final boss of the fight. He's gonna start the fight with Tank Purge, this is a raid-wide AoE, so put up some mitigation for this. And then after that he will be targeting the main tank with Viscous Aetherplasm. When he applies this debuff, it'll do a tiny AoE around the person that he puts it on. So you want to make sure that you are spread out from the person that is getting this debuff, because uh, otherwise multiple players will get it. Later into the fight, uh, it'll just put it on some random players and you don't need to be spread for that one. But for the ones that he manually applies like this, you don't want to be stacked onto that players, but it only happens twice at the start of this fight and then also a little bit later, which I'll talk about in just a second. What Viscous Aetherplasm does is as soon as it reaches zero, it's a debuff that counts down, it'll do a little explosion on that person and it'll do damage that can be soaked with the rest of the party. Uh, so you can choose what you want to do with this because this party wants to just use this time to deal damage instead. I'm just going to be soloing this as a tank with cooldowns uh, but if you don't mind putting like an indom out and putting like a sucker up or something like that, uh, you can just throw it into the group. It doesn't actually do that much damage. Uh, so you can definitely do that if you want to do so. Right after this is gonna do homing lasers, which is a tank buster on the second player in aggro. So your co-tank uh, needs to make sure that they're second in aggro so that they can get hit by this so that it doesn't go onto the rest of the party. And then here the viscous aetherplasm will also explode. Um, but as I mentioned before, I was going to be soloing that one. Otherwise, you can just throw that one into the group. And then we go into Ultimate Predation, the first trio mechanic, so to speak. There's going to be a lot of things going on over here. There are two ways to do it, which is the cheese way and the legit way. The way you're going to be seeing it is the cheese way, but I will also explain how to do it legit. Because uh, the way you do it legit is going to save you a lot of resources. So I'll just let it play out first and then I'll explain what is happening afterwards.
and that is the whole mechanic. It's just a very quick dodge of everything that is happening. So first things first, position yourself in the middle. Look at where Garuda is. Now where Garuda is, is gonna indicate where our safe spots are going to be. So because she is on this side of the arena, we can run either to the right or we can run to the back. Now we are gonna run to the right because Titan is in the back. So you're basically gonna run away from Garuda where there isn't a primal. Ultima himself can be a safe spot. So if Garuda was, let's say, on the back over here, where you can see all of my buttons, then B could have been a safe spot. But because Garuda is next to Ultima, we don't have to worry about that. So we run to A. The first safe spot that you're gonna stand in is going to be a Cardinal because of Ifrit. Ifrit is gonna dash through a random intercardinal. In this case, he's over here, so he's gonna dash like this. Um, but he could also be standing over here, so he could dash through Ultima, for example. Then, Garuda is gonna do her point-blank AoE into her donut, because she's awakened. Titan is gonna do double landslides. Ifrit is gonna dash through, and then after he does the dash, his afterburner, which is called Crimson Cyclone, if I'm not mistaken, is gonna hit onto the Cardinals. And then Ultima is also going to do an AoE around himself. So if you were standing next to Ultima, you would have to dodge through this side. So even if you do the cheese, you would still need to run a little bit to the side. Uh, and if you are not doing the cheese, you will of course need to run away from Ultima because you can't get hit by his ability. If you are doing the cheese, you don't really need to care about too much. But I'll explain as we go. So, first off, run away from Garuda. Second, stand on your Cardinal and dodge the landslide. As the landslide goes off, Ifrit also dashes through, so that is your indicator to run away and dodge the second landslide that is coming out, usually by running into the landslide. And then after that, the Crimson Cyclone of Ifrit goes out with the Donut AoE from Garuda. Now this is where you would normally have to be in the real safe spot. Um, but if you're using the Hyper Mitigation one, which is what we did over here, you can just stand on the Cardinal and eat the Crimson Cyclone of Ifrit, uh, as if you have all of your mitigation up for this, and then you can just mitigate through that one. Um, because Crit Adlo has been changed in Shadowbringers, I would not be surprised if this requires tank limit break now. Uh, but if it doesn't, then you can just hyper mitigate it if you want. I personally would advise against it, because it eats up a lot of your resources that you would otherwise be able to use throughout the rest of the phase. Uh, which there are plenty of reasons why you would want to save resources for that. And then at the end, Garuda jumps away, so we again get Feather Rains, so you need to dodge those as well. Now, if you want to do the legit dodge, the way it works is as follows. So as you can see, on the outside of the arena, there are a bunch of runes that you can see, like on these little markers over here. Basically, the fourth rune is your best friend. So when you're dodging into the landslide of Titan, you want to dodge towards the fourth rune, and that will dodge both the Cyclone from Garuda, as well as the Crimson Cyclone from Ifrit. So if you do a legit dodge over here, you dodge the landslide. Right after here, when this is over, you run to this little spot over here, the fourth rune, close to the edge of the arena, as that would be your safe spot. So here you see all the AoEs going out, right? So you have the Crimson Cyclone here, you have the Garuda Cyclone over here, and then this little spot over here on the fourth rune would have been safe. You can also go to the left, as there is also a safe spot over here. Uh, so say if Ultima was standing next to you, you can do either left or right, you just dodge away from Ultima. And then of course you wait in that spot, wait for Garuda to jump, and then dodge the Feather Rains like that. For the next section, we are going to be baiting where Titan is spawning. So first of all, Ifrit will always spawn north. Uh, where you spawn Titan is completely up to you. Uh, you can spawn him south or north, it doesn't really change all that much. We are going to be dragging Ultima towards the south, so Titan is going to spawn in the north as well. Ifrit's position is always going to be north. So, as you can see, we just pull him slightly off-center, that is already enough to spawn Titan. Our two ranged players are gonna move all the way south to start baiting the eruptions, which yet again is going to be four sets of eruptions. So one, two, three, and four. Once that is done, everybody stacks together at the front of the boss. Doesn't matter if you're south or north for this. Uh, again, there is gonna be uh, a tether from Ifrit between two players. 
Uh, this one doesn't really matter though, because like you're pretty much always going to stand together for this mechanic, so you don't have to worry about that too much. Then Ultima does Radiant Plumes, so just dodge these, but stand as close to the edge of these things as possible, because Titan is going to be dropping bombs in the middle of the arena. These can drop very close to where you are dodging this mechanic, so you want to stand as far outside of the middle as possible, so that you do not get hit by these, basically. And then as soon as these go out, dodge to the edge of the arena. Here, both Titan as well as Ultima are going to be doing a landslide. Titan is awakened, so he does it twice. Ultima is gonna do it once. The way you dodge this is you run south, you wait for the Titan landslide, and then as soon as you see this one, you dodge into the side where Titan is standing. So in this case, we are going towards the left, because Titan is on the left. If Titan is on the right, you dodge towards the right. So we go right, you can see the Ultima landslide over here. As soon as the first landslides go out, you just dodge in, because uh, Ultima does not do it a second time, and you can see the Titan bombs exploding here in the middle. Then the main tank will get a Viscous Aetherplasm, so you need to make sure that the main tank is away from the group. Titan is going to start doing Tumults, so rate-wide AoE damage is going to constantly come out over here. Then, after the Viscous Aetherplasm is applied, Garuda is going to spawn her sisters. Uh, these don't really do all that much, but Garuda is going to do rate-wide AoE damage. The sisters and Garuda herself are going to jump away, so Feather Rains. And then Ultima himself will be doing another off-tank Tank Buster. This is why we're going to tank swap over here, because the homing lasers, as well as the Viscous Aetherplasm, resolve around the same time, so you can just use a Tank Invuln to cheese these. Uh, if you want to have a Paladin take care of this, you do need to make sure that the Paladin takes the first Tank Buster from Ifrit, not the second one. So that is why my Paladin used Hallowed Ground on the first Ifrit Tank Buster, because that means that it will be up again over here to use it a second time. I'm not quite sure with the DPS that we have right now if you kill them too quickly, because if you do otherwise you might have to slow down your DPS uh, to make sure that Hallowed Ground is up again. If you do end up having a Paladin, just test out the timings to see uh, if the hallowed ground is up again over here. So basically, your main tank is on one side, your party is on the rest, or is on the other side. Uh, I am standing in a very bad position here, I should be standing with the party by the way, because I'm making my life hard basically. So, sisters will jump away. So first they do an AoE around themselves, but you don't have to care because they're too far away. Uh, if you're standing north or south, uh, you basically just can't be standing east or west. Then Garuda does her Mistral Shriek, which is the Raid White AoE. Right as Garuda does the Mistral Shriek, the sisters jump away, so you need to move for the Feather Rains. Right after the first set of Feather Rains, Ultima will be doing the Homing Laser. And then right as the Homing Laser finishes, we will get another set of Feather Rains. And then we go into Ultimate Annihilation. For Annihilation, Ultima is going to teleport towards the north side of the arena. So if you were standing south, move towards north. If you dodge this north, you just stay over here. And then there are a bunch of things that are going to be happening. So I'm going to try my best to explain it the best as possible. First things first, there will be green orbs that need to be soaked by a specific amount of players. Soaking an orb will do two things, or three things basically. It'll deal damage to everyone that soaked it. It'll increase the Ultima Aether Gauge by the amount of players that soaked it. So the more players that soak it, the faster this gauge is gonna fill. When this gauge reaches 100, it's enraged, by the way. Uh, whenever someone dies, like running into the wall or something, or just dying to a mechanic, the gauge will also fill up. Uh, so that's why it's important that you don't die. Outside of that, depending on the amount of players that soaked an orb, a mechanic later into the fight will get a different timer. So the more people that soaked, the more time you are given later into the fight. The way that we are going to be soaking it is 4, 3, 1, 1. 4 and 3 is going to make it easy for the second soak of that mechanic. 1, 1 doesn't matter because that one, that first soak happens immediately. Um, but you'll see that later into the fight. So that is why we have assigned our players like that. So first of all, we are starting on the left side of Ultima. We wait for the first Titan Weight of the Land to come out. And you also see that we have another stack marker from Ifrit. We move to the right. Then over here, as soon as the second one appears, the second Weight of the Land, a Garuda Tether will appear. 
this one is going to be taken away by our ranged player with a thermal low stack. Remember that thermal low stack was obtained in the first phase of the fight at Garuda. We all move to the left. There's going to be a Mistral something, I don't remember the name of this, but basically this blue thing on the outside of the arena is an AoE marker, so don't stand into that. So we are on the left side, we are taking our Ifrit stack marker over here, right as this resolves, the AoE on the outside will also resolve. And this is where the player, or ranged player with the tether, is going to move to the back. So stack marker goes out, weight of the land goes out, Three players move to the left, the four players that are soaking the first orb move to the right, and then the player with the tether moves to the back. Then we wait. Uh, these purple tethers over here basically indicate the players that soaked the orbs. So you don't have to pay too much attention to that. Now over here we have Super Cyclone. This is from the uh, Thermal Low debuff being cleansed, so it's a little bit of rate-wide damage, but not too much. And right as the Super Cyclone comes out, Garuda will be jumping away, so we need to move for the Feather Rains. Right as this happens, one of our two healers will again get a Searing Wind from Ifrit, so that player will need to run towards the south side of the arena so that they don't hit other players. Right after the Feather Rains, we again have our assigned players soak the second orb. After the second orb, everybody moves north, except the healer, they move south because now we need to dodge both Titan Landslides as well as Ifrit. Now, because I don't have a healer POV of this, I'll be showing pictures in just a second when I recap this mechanic. So we wait for Ifrit to dash. As soon as Ifrit dashes, we are going to be moving left or right. You can choose which way you dodge into a Titan Landslide. Then we have our Afterburner of Ifrit hitting the Cardinals. We have another orb spawning that needs to be soaked by one player because the last two orbs are being soaked by one player we have our tank assigned for this then we again have an aoe on the outside of the arena so you need to dodge that one as well we have another garuda tether spawn this one is going to be picked up by our healer uh, that has the searing wind debuff in the back then we soak the first orb we soak the second orb then we have Tank Purge happening together with Super Cyclone, which is from the Garuda Tether. And then, of course, Garuda is going to jump away. So we all have to move to dodge the Feather Rains. And that ends this mechanic. So in terms of the healer, what they need to do is as follows. So for the very first one, they are basically going to be standing over here. Uh, use your Titan Landslide as an indicator for this. And then after the first Landslide goes off, they need to move to an Intercardinal. So they can just move to where Ifrit spawned over here, making sure that you, of course, dodge uh, the thing that was on the outside of the arena. So that is how the healer with the Searing Wind would dodge it. Stand on this little edge of the Titan Landslide and then just move out over here to dodge it like that. So I'm going to very quickly recap this mechanic um, because it is a pretty rough one to first see it. Um, but the execution wise is actually flows very nice. So you stand on the left, you go right. You go left, ranged player takes the tether, players that don't soak go left, players that do soak go right, wait for the shriek, move to dodge the plumes, healer with your searing wind runs south, soak second time, go to your cardinal positions and then of course your healer stands on the like the cleave thingy of titan dodge into the landslide another tether appears your healer picks this one up and then the last two orbs get soaked tank purge raid white aoe together with garuda shriek so move to dodge the feather rains and then we are done with this mechanic very important the healer with searing wind stay in the back because you still have one more pulsating aoe remaining which will happen right here uh, so it's very important that you wait for this last explosion to happen. So over here we are going to have a series of tank busters and pushbacks. So it's just going to be important that you dodge these things. So first of all we have again the thing on the outside of the arena that we want to dodge. Then we have homing laser. So on the off tank will be a tank buster. Then we have once again the AoE on the outside of the arena. This time with radiant plumes in the middle. So wait for the outside to be safe. Move out move in 
Right after the Radiant Plumes, there will be a Tank Buster on the main tank that is not telegraphed. So pop some cooldowns as soon as you move out, which is over here, the Diffractive Laser. Now this is where we end up tank swapping. Then we have another AoE on the outside of the arena, this time with a knockback. So healers make sure you put up a shield uh, so that players don't get knocked back to the outside of the arena. Over here, that's the knockback. Then we have another homing laser, uh, but because we tank swapped, I'm going to be taking that one. Then we have another AoE on the outside of the arena, another knockback and another tank buster on the main tank, another diffractive laser, but we're not going to be seeing that because we pushed Ultima below 50%. Basically, as soon as Ultima goes below 50%, he will go into ultimate suppression, which is the final big trio mechanic, so to speak. Um, so that is why you're most likely not going to be seeing these last mechanics anyways. So it is AoE on the outside with homing lasers, the tank buster on the off tank. It is AoE on the outside, which is called Eye of the Storm, as I uh, remember it now with the Radiant Plumes, so you wait for the AoE to disappear, then you move to the outside, then you get Tank Buster on the main tank. You have again AoE on the outside with a knockback, so people need to be shielded into another homing lasers, so Tank Buster on the off tank, and then you have another AoE on the outside with a knockback into a Defractive Laser, which is a Tank Buster on the main tank. And at that point, you should be pushing him below 50%, to go into ultimate suppression. Now, unfortunately enough, my POV is completely garbage for this um, because the way that this group did it is also a way that I would not recommend it. So for this, I'm gonna be pulling up pictures, again, courtesy of the Cleese guide of how you should be doing it. So the positioning of these primals is always going to be the same. What you want to do to begin is your two tanks position themselves in front of Titan, pop a cooldown. With the cooldowns that we have right now, your spammable cooldown will suffice. Everybody else spreads across the edge around Garuda. This will be very important. So, as soon as the mechanic begins, three random players will be getting an eruption. So everybody moves towards the first sister, and then the eruption players are going to be slowly moving across the map towards Ifrit. After this, two players will be targeted with Mistral Song, that's that green debuff that gives you a cleave. So both of the sisters are gonna be cleaving those two players. So both of those players move behind the two tanks who have a cooldown running so that they can take the cleave that is coming from the two sisters. After, so as you can see over here, at this point, the eruptions will have reached their final destination where one of the eruption players will get jailed. So they'll be staying inside of that eruption uh, because they can't move anymore. Then we will of course have our big tornado dropping over here from these two cleaves from the sisters. Uh, Garuda is also going to do a big AoE, but we don't care about this really because we're on the other side of the arena. The jail will have dropped at this point as well. And then the other players keep rotating to the left. And then last but not least, we have one player that has not gotten a mechanic yet who will get a light pillar, which is an AoE that chases them, so they just want to keep running away from that one. And then we will also have Garuda and her sisters jumping away, so we will be getting two shrieks. So when the first shriek happens, we move to the jail towards the outside of the arena. When the second shriek happens, we move to the inside of the arena through the jail. So that's how the whole mechanic works. So taking it from my very garbage POV. The party is over here on the side. My co-tank is over here in the north. I am standing here AFK in the south. So we have first eruption. We have the green markers coming out. So those players are running behind the tanks that should be standing here north. Then we have a jail marker coming out. That player will position themselves right behind this sister in front of Ifrit. Then... We have our Garuda AoEs coming out over here as well. As soon as all of that is done, the first streak will happen. So you move towards the jail. The second streak happens, you move away from the jail. You kill the jail. And then we go into part two of the mechanic. I'm going to let it run out and then I'm going to explain some more things because there are some other things happening as well uh, that might need some explanation. So that's the end of the mechanic. Now, as you could see over here, there is an AoE behind us, and when we kill the jail, you get a better POV of this as well on the outside of the arena, 
over here and then behind us to the left as well over here. This is an AoE that comes from Ultima. He's basically going to be doing laser beams across the map. You'll do one left, one middle, one to the right uh, in a random order as well. So you basically need to pay attention to that one as well when you are dodging. Uh, so that is something you definitely need to pay attention to. Another thing that is very difficult to see is that there are plumes cycling on the outside of the arena, uh, which you can see one over here on the left, but you're going to get a clearer view of this over here. This little blue green feather flying around on the outside, you don't want to run into that because if you run into that, that will explode for a big AOE damage as well, uh, which will basically most likely cause you to wipe. Uh, so definitely don't stand on the outside of the arena when this mechanic is happening. You haven't seen these feathers before yet, and that is because we awaken Garuda super late. Uh, so that is why you haven't seen these yet. Uh, but basically, stay away from that. So I'm just going to take it from the top again real quick. And then I'll also explain what is happening in the second part of the mechanic. So ultimate suppression, tanks in front of Titan, the group in front of Garuda. Eruptions go out. Green markers go out, markers behind the tanks, eruptions keep moving forward, move to the left, light pillar player keeps running, first shriek to the granite goal or jail, second shriek dodge that as well, kill the jail as soon as possible. Then of course always dodge the AoEs coming from Ultima as well. Then we have Titan doing double landslide, we have Garuda doing a tether, uh, we had this tether being picked up by our second healer, so both of the healers have a thermal low stack going into this fight uh, because it's random which one of the two needs to take the tether during Annihilation, the previous trio. Uh, so we just had the other healer that did not take it during Annihilation take it now. Then we also have another random player, I believe this is always on the DPS, uh, get the Ifrit stack marker so we just have the healer run away from us towards Garuda. We have the rest staying here whilst dodging the landslide of course. Then the AoEs go out, so over here we had our tether being cleansed, over here we had the Ifrit stack, then we have the Garuda Shriek, so everybody needs to move to dodge the Feather Rains, then we have a tank perch from our Ultima, so everybody needs to be healed up for that as soon as possible, and then after this we have another Ultima, so tank limit break 3, put up some more mitigation because this does hit quite hard. And then we go into the Etheric Boom phase. This is the phase that I was talking about before with the orbs that we had to soak. So there are going to be four sets of orbs spawning. And again, I have a little picture over here, courtesy of Cleese. And you'll have to do it like follows. So the two orbs that had one person uh, soaking them will spawn southeast and southwest. So that is why we have our party on one side of the boss, our tanks on the other side, to soak these immediately. That is why we can soak them with one person. The other two sets of orbs on the north side are the ones that were shared with four players and three players. So those have a lot more time before they explode. Tank Perch is also a knockback, so you get knocked back into these, they explode immediately. Wait for one or two GCDs of healing and then move into the north ones. So again, I'm gonna pull it back just a bit. This is the Ultima cost that you can see. So again, heal up, put mitigation up, Etheric Boom is gonna knock back players. Uh, in my POV, it's reversed. We have our tanks on the right side and our group on the left side. So Etheric Boom pushes everyone back. I don't get knocked back because I have a uh, inner release up. That's why I didn't get knocked back. But you get knocked back into the first Etheric Booms. You give your healers some time to heal. You move into the second Etheric Booms. And that's the end of that phase. And then we are now going to be going into the primal roulette. Over here, we're going to get a couple of things happening. We're getting the three primals back to back in a random order. Three random players are also going to get viscous aetherplasm. So as you can see, Ultima did like a little animation that put three viscous aetherplasms on random players. Can be the main tank as well. So you need to pay attention to that. And then we're going to go into a dance of the primals, basically. What I would recommend is for everyone to always be stacked on the north side for this, or on the A marker, in case it is Titan first. Now, the way my group did it, I was over here, um, because we already discussed how we were going to dodge it if it was Titan. I would just recommend everybody always on A. It's going to make your life easier. So, we wait for the first 
primal to appear. In our case, it is Ifrit. Ifrit will first do eruption on random players, and then he'll do the afterburners on the cardinals, which is why we start on A to bait the eruptions over here, and then we move to an intercardinal to dodge the afterburners or the crimson cyclones. And this is also where the first viscous aetherplasm will explode, which is why the whole party is stacked together. Right after this, Ifrit will do his raid white AoE, so again, heal up, put up some mitigation, because this does hit quite hard. After this is done, everybody moves back to A to prepare for the second primal, which in this case is Garuda. So for Garuda, you want to position right next to her, um, because of course she's going to do point blank AoE into donut AoE, so you need to move in to dodge this one. And then as soon as you dodge inwards, this is also where the viscous aetherplasm explodes. Then Garuda will do her raid white AoE, so again put up some mitigation. Don't run back to A yet, because Garuda is going to jump away, meaning that she's going to leave behind those feather reins. Uh, so that's why you need to wait until she jumps, and then you can move to A. And then we have Titan as our last one, which is three weight of the lands. After the second one over here is when the viscous aetherplasm explodes. After the third one, heal up, because there will be raid white AoE damage coming out from Titan. And then you are now done and going into the final burn. So over here again, the Ultima Aether should be around 50% probably at this point. And now he's just going to be gaining 2 gauge every second or so as he starts powering up. And then once it reaches 100, that is where he will do his Enrage. Uh, the way how the players get taken away from the Enrage is based on DPS. So the lowest DPS player will get jailed first. And then he basically just goes up the list until the player with the highest DPS and then, of course, this is also where you will want to be using your final Limit Break 3, because you should have that at this point as well, to kill the boss. So as soon as it reaches 100, as you can see, players will be getting stunned and then taken up into their jails. And then hopefully you can kill him before he kills you. So that's going to do it for this walkthrough of Ultima. Of course, as always, if you have any more questions about the fight, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And I'll try to answer you to the best of my ability. So with that, I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank my Patreons for their support. And I'll see you in the next one.